So, just before we get started, let me introduce everyone who is on the line tonight. So, um, the fellow you see sort of front and center on the screen right now is my good friend and brother Alex. Uh, the fellow who is down in the corner, well, that's me and I'm just waving to you. Um, the guy that's uh, right here but has like uh, just sort of a generic person icon, that's our friend and brother Dan. Uh, he's with us tonight over the telephone because that's something Microsoft Teams can do. And this lovely lady over here, that's my wife and she's, all, as always, monitoring for quality control. Because I'm way out of control. <laughs> All right, so welcome to the Bible study, everyone. Let's just open in prayer really quickly. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you have allowed us to proceed with the Bible study this evening. We thank you for your faithfulness, and we ask now that you would speak to our hearts at this time so that we would be able to understand what your word says and be equipped watchmen on the walls. We commit ourselves into your hands, in his name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So this week we're actually Amen. in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but we're in verses 20 to 34. There's, it's a 15 verse section that kind of deals with, uh, well, we'll see what it deals with when we get to it. Uh, before we do anything else though, what we want to do is read the chapter. Now, 15 verses, if three of us read, that's five verses each, right guys? So, um, yep. <clears throat> Dan, I'd like you to read verses 20 to 24, and then uh, mm -hmm. Alex, I'd like you to read verses uh, 25 to 29, and I'll finish up. All right, take it away, Dan. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starting at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power for he must reign until he has put any that will be abolished is death for he has put all things in subjection and under his feet but he says all things are put in subjection uh, it is evident that he is accepted uh, who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subject, subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead are not raised at all? Why then are they baptized for them? Verse 30. Why are, uh, why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought, and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this. Um, three questions. The first question, what does it say? And this is the part where we summarize the chapter by reading the text and splitting, into, splitting that into workable thought units. Um, yeah, so we give each of those thought units a between 5 and 10 word title is usually sufficient. And um, that's sort of the what does it say part of the chapter. Now what I do after that is I look through it for common themes. 
I find that common theme and I make that the title and I pick out a, a verse from the chapter that is key to my understanding, therefore a key verse, um, and that's the what does the chapter say part. The second question is what does the chapter mean? Not what does the chapter mean to me? That's actually kind of irrelevant and nobody really cares what the chapter means to me personally anyway. That has more to do with application. We need to know what God meant when he wrote those things in the scripture through the apostle. Otherwise we're just kind of, you know, in a... we might be shooting like a firing squad but it's like we're all standing in a circle and the targets in the middle no don't do that we need to know what God meant when he said those things and really you need to be a Christian to understand that for the most part because it's the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth and the Holy Spirit only lives in believers that is followers of Jesus and the third question is what am I gonna do about it um, this is the part where we can derive a more personal application from the chapter and what we can do is uh, sort of okay this is what it says this is what God meant when he said that and that means I have to do this sometimes it's a broad general brushstroke type principle sometimes it's a very specific thing that God is pointing out to us either way it works because God speaks to us both ways in his word so, as an audible, who came this evening with a chapter summary that they can share with me? Uh, I did. Okay, that's one. I'm going to assume that that's the only one just from the other uh, folks who are silent. Uh, all right, Alex, go ahead and share with us what you had for a chapter summary. Okay, well, this is from Matthew's Hen Matthew Henry's uh, commentary on the whole Bible. Uh, uh, it's a. Uh, it actually. Uh, he actually uh, uh, explains from verse twenty thirty four uh, what's in the 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 paragraph. Um, all that are all that are by faith united to Christ are by His resurrection assured of their own. As through the sin of the first Adam, all men became became mortal, because all had from Him the same sinful nature. Must submit to His rule accept the salvation and live to his glory then shall we re rejoice in the com completion of his undertaking that God may receive the whole glory of our salvation and that we may forever serve him and enjoy his favor what shall those do who who are baptized uh, for the dead if the dead rise not at all perhaps baptism is used here in the figure for afflictions sufferings and martyrdom as Matthew chapter 20, verse 22 and 23 uh, say. What is or will become of those who have suffered many and great injuries and have even lost their lives for this doctrine of the resurrection if the dead rise not at all? Whatever the meaning may be, doubtless the apostles' argument was understood by the Corinthians. And it is as plain to us that Christianity would be a foolish profession if it proposed advantage to themselves by their faithfulness to God and to have our fruits our fruit to holiness, that our end may be everlasting life. But we must not live like beasts, and we do not die like them. It must be ignorance of God that leads any to disbelieve the resurrection and future life. Those who own a God and a providence, and observe how unequal things are in the present life, how frequently the men far fare worse, cannot doubt as to an afterstate, where everything will be set to, to rights. Let us not be joined with ungodly men, but warn all around us, especially children and young persons, to shun them as a pestilence. Let us awake to righteousness and not sin. And that's my line chapter summary. Okay, that's great. Like you said, Matthew Henry, right? So Yeah, because he uh he uh condenses uh verses from like verse this and to verse that. Which is essentially all you're really doing with a chapter summary. Um, and you know he basically did it with every chapter in the Bible so actually I think over time so have I but I didn't always write it down and if I did write it down I don't always hub my notes because well I've probably been doing this since 1986 maybe 1987 mm -hmm. um, anyway 
And Jerry, I've lost track of how many times you've moved over those years. <laughs> yeah, actually me too. So uh, I could probably sit down and think about it, but that's not why we're here. Um, tonight we're actually exactly. in, <laughs> Tonight we're actually in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 34. Now, last time, just sort of to review, we looked at the apologetic that Paul began for the good news of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, as the time closed last time, we began to focus on the resurrection, uh, specifically the proof that God did what he said he was going to do. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, in that Jesus lived a perfect life, he allowed himself to be crucified at the end of that time, and while he was doing so, he took the unmixed wrath of God so that we wouldn't have to taste it later, um, ever, actually. Um, so after you know, basically being crucified on the Friday, he took, as everyone did, the Sabbath off, and he rose from the grave on the, the third day, which would have been the first day of the week, Sunday. Um, and God the Father uh, raised him from the dead, scriptures tell us, showing that Jesus not only paid the price for our wrongdoings, but that he broke sin's power in our lives so that we raised from the dead, emphasis is mine, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. So which member of the Godhead raised him from the dead? Don't know. It just says God here. Okay? Don't think it was God the Son. Okay? Or he would have said that he rose from the grave. Or that he rose himself from the grave. Um, because That's called active voice. And that's not what it was. It says that he was raised. That's the passive voice. Um, Almighty power, all of it, all together, kind of thing. Uh, so, um, any one of them could have done this, but not just any one of them did. Galatians 1 1, however, tells us directly Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of men, but through Jesus' persons. Um, not aspects or modes, because I'm not a modalist heretic, and they all play different and altogether appropriate parts in the drama that has been human history. Um, for God knew what was going to happen with men before he ever created us. Our human minds sometimes have difficulty understanding this because God is so much bigger and more complex than the smartest man who ever lived because even Solomon couldn't get a handle on him. You know, and, and if you don't believe me, just read the book of Ecclesiastes. It drove Solomon nuts, at least temporarily. Um, However, there are things we can see, and sometimes pretty easily, regardless of which member of the triune God was responsible, God's anointed one rose from the grave on the third day. As we learned last time, this is history's most credibly established fact, and also the most hotly contented. Now, we closed last time with three questions that people really have to answer in their rush to dismiss their own account. What got into the disciples? And three, where was the body that is the body of Jesus? Now, we concluded that the resurrection of, of Christ from the dead by the power of God was in fact the reality that you cannot easily deny. Now, this week, we're going to focus on the reality of that resurrection because it's really the central point of Christianity. Um, if you can take that fact out of Christianity, and a lot of really smart people have tried and all have failed to date, some becoming Christians themselves, Dr. Josh McDowell included in that number, uh, and he was an atheist when he started, I've heard his testimony, um, then the whole, re the whole religion and practices thereof crumble. Um, but Paul moves beyond the logic and the proofs offered last time, 
and just begins to talk about it in this section as if it's just a reality. Uh, so I broke the chapter down as follows. Uh, taking the first part of verse 20 as my key verse, I called the whole chapter, this whole text, the reality of the resurrection. Verses 20 to 24 I called the order of the resurrection. 25 to 28, the one that performs the resurrection. And 29 to 34, <laughs> incentives for the resurrection. Um, so as you know, I actually called this section of text the reality of the resurrection. Uh, for all of you that like it when I get all logical and make the pieces all come together, uh, you may be disappointed to learn that I'm just going to assume that the resurrection is a fact this evening. Well, because it is, but also because we spent some time last week establishing that it is in fact a reality. Uh, I'm doing that mostly because it's what Paul is doing. Um, and we haven't got the four and a half hours for the study. We're live streaming. <laughs> okay. And, and I'm not Justin Peters, who just released a four and a half hour video that I watched on Monday, by the way. Um, I can honestly say that you're not going to be disappointed at this text, though. Okay, because there are some issues that are going to require our logic. Verse 20a, the reality of the resurrection. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. Uh, key verse uh, 20a, the reality of the resurrection. I'll read you the part of the verse that I took. It says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. Okay, so last week we looked at proofs of the resurrection of humans from the dead. Now, such a thing has examples throughout human history, and we briefly mentioned a few, and then I hinted that there will be more of them in the future. I'm going to leave that aspect of this study until the next study, when we're going to look at that part that in the, in the actual text. But I can honestly say that every human that has ever lived will someday be raised from the state that we call death. Uh, they aren't all going to be cons uh, going to be what God calls alive, um, accomplish His own ends. Now, what we're considering tonight is the reality that the resurrection from the dead means uh, uh, what? Uh, sorry, excuse me. I'm just trying to. There we go. What What we're considering tonight is the reality that the resurrection from the dead means to us and the details and rationales that surround it. Jesus is certainly the most notable person to have risen from the dead, and I believe it is his resurrection that makes all resurrections possible, whether they occurred before the time he actually walked the earth, or later when we get to that text, uh, which is going to be next week, hopefully. So let's jump into the text here. Verses 20 to 24, the order of the resurrection. This grand resurrection of which Paul speaks can be viewed as a single event that has been stretched over all of human history, the central point being Jesus' resurrection from the grave. Now the reason I say this is because the resurrection, it is the resurrection of Jesus that makes all other resurrections possible, whether past or future. Think of the way the saints of the Old Testament were saved, for example. They believed in the coming Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One of God, depending on what language you want to use to refer to him. Now, we New Testament believers are saved by coming to this same Messiah, because God is really outside of time, and he knows the end from the beginning, as it were. Um, all of this becomes possible by any event placed inside that time-space continuum. But there's an order to it, and Paul explains some of that in these verses. So let's see what he means. Verse 20, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. Well, what we see uh, here is Paul starting with what I would consider to uh, the key to my understanding of this text. Okay, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. 
And that phrase, but now, is a clue that the context of the remark comes from what has immediately come before it by way of comparison. You'll recall from last time that what comes before this is a discussion of what the faith would look like if there was no resurrection. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead. This paragraph is a, continu a continuation of that logic of Paul and into reality. Um, so Paul also uses the phrase, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Now, Christ is the first fruits, clearly, and that makes a great deal of sense. Uh, the Feast of First Fruits was a Jewish sacrificial festival where the first fruits of the crops were offered to God as a thank offering. And that is this full, uh, and this is fulfilled in Christ. And that should surprise none of us. Okay, interestingly, that feast is celebrated at Pentecost. And Pentecost, in the Christian world, is known as the day the church was born. Um, I'll just mention it here because Paul has, but it's worth a study all on its own. It's just not the main subject of our study. Um, those who are asleep refers to believers that have died, essentially. Jesus doesn't talk about unbelievers in the sense of having fallen asleep. We know they're dead. Okay, and, and if you wonder why, what that might mean, that unbelievers are dead, follow me for a moment to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. I'll read it for you. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne and books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds now this passage for the new reader begs a question where are the living because all John saw were the dead they're not here uh, as it turns out, they were dealt with at a separate time uh, as believers and followers of Jesus. Um, this is the final judgment on the human race. Um, they may be standing by watching the, those who are alive, but it doesn't really say, so you can't assume that. And if you wonder what the actual standard of judgment is, well, you can find God's moral law in Exodus chapter 20, if you wonder what the qualification for a pass into eternal life is, verse 15 of Revelation 20 tells us, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Oh, I remember that Carmen tune. Is your name in that book? Is your name in that book? Is your name in that book for sure? If you've been forgiven and your name is written, raise your hands. Praise the Lord. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. My friends, the Lord has provided a way of escape for those that are willing to turn to Him. Verse 21, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Now Paul is engaging in that logic that we like that we become very familiar with actually over the time as the logic of sin and redemption. Adam sinned and death entered humanity through that sin. Uh, it was made manifest when Cain murdered Abel, but it entered the realm of humanity when Adam sinned by eating the fruit God said not to eat. Um, and because we're all Adam's offspring, we all have that problem. So, it's like that with the resurrection. Jesus died, and God raised him from the dead. And all men will be resurrected from what we call death. We will all rise from the grave. As the Apostles' Creed says, 
some to death, some to life. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Now that doesn't mean that all will be justified before God. Otherwise, why would he take the time to compare notes with what's in the book of life? Verse 23. Oh, I will say this. I'll add this. Um, Adam gave all humans death. But Jesus will give life to all that will turn to him. And no one will be forced into it, unlike death. Verse 23. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming, and that's where the verse stops, but here's where the order starts. Having instituted resurrection as a principle, he now tells about the order that the resurrection has. This is not necessarily a chronological thing, but has more in, in some ways to do with the rank of the individual being resurrected. Um, the first one resurrected in order of rank or importance. The first one resurrected, interestingly, I think in rank of importance, but not actually chronologically, is Christ, who here again is called the first fruits. Now, I need to say a word to folks that uh, claim the Christians are the first fruits. Um, Please be very careful how you say that. It is true, and Scripture does support that, but it's Christ who is the fulfillment of the feast under the law, and the rest of us only hold that position because of Him. So be careful when you say, Oh no, the church is the first fruits. Not quite. We are, but it's because Christ is. Um, this isn't some weird thing that makes us overcoming champions. Um, he's the champion. We only win with him. Apart from him, we can do nothing, Jesus said in John 15.5. Uh, Christ is the first one of importance who is raised. Um, so who's next? Well, those who are Christ's at his coming. Okay, who's that? Oh, beloved, that's us. <laughs> uh, those who belong to Christ, living or dead, I might add, will be resurrected. And anyone who is alive on the earth when this happens goes along with that. You know, again, we'll, we're going to leave that for the next study. Uh, so, verse 24. Then comes the end when he hands uh, over the kingdom of God uh, in Revelation chapter 20, we call it the Great White Throne Judgment. I've heard it called the Uncreation Day of the Universe. That's the end we're talking about, because after that, Jesus will just simply hand the kingdom over to the Father. So when does that happen? Well, when He, that is God the Son, has abolished all rule except His own. Um, but really, even His own because he's going to surrender that rule over to God the Father. When he has abolished all authority, again, when all of the creation is submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, he will submit to the Father. Again, yeah, again, when all of the creation will submit to him, he will submit to the Father. And power, when all other power is used against him and is shown to be useless, he will surrender his own power to God the Father. When there's only uh, one power, there will only be one authority, and subsequently, one rule. But with God the Father in charge, there really doesn't need to be anybody else in charge. What Paul is getting at here is that not only is resurrection a reality, but there are even rules in order to it. And it means that we need to look at our next thought unit. That's verses 25 to 28, the one that performs the resurrection. Um, 
I suppose it goes without saying somehow that the resurrection is a supernatural event. Science, that is real science, will tell us that cells have what is called a senescence point. That is a point at which aging cells stop being able to divide. Uh, and that means that the body's ability to repair itself sort of comes to a stop, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, sometimes caused by accidents, sometimes caused by disease. Uh, but most human cells will divide for a period of time of between 55 and 100 years normally with most people falling inside that range of years uh, somewhere in terms of lifespan. There are people who live longer, there are people who don't live as long. Um, all of those are really outside the main focus area of what we're talking about and the problem with that is everybody still dies, but we'll say a bit about that in a moment. Um, accidents can prematurely end a life, notwithstanding this is just part of the human condition since the fall. What this means is that dead tissue, once it has died, will usually remain dead. Um, some science fiction authors, like Mary Shelley, for example, wrote interesting things about electrical power being able to reanimate dead tissue. That monster that Dr. Frankenstein uh, created was literally stitched together and then reanimated by a direct lightning strike. Uh, but it doesn't work that way, really. Uh, all lightning will actually do <laughs> uh, is cook the tissue as the proteins uh, that denature kind of they start to denature around 57 or 58 degrees Celsius so people will say yet was that not a resurrection of sorts Frankenstein um, yeah no it wasn't throughout history though there's always been some kind of a belief in bodily resurrection um, the pharaohs of ancient Egypt had their bodies mummified so as to preserve it against the eventuality of death uh, so today this is only understood as a natural phenomenon and images of zombies come to mind when you talk about people rising from the grave um, but as I stated a moment ago resurrection is a supernatural process God must do it because otherwise well Frankensteins and zombies I guess so let's get into that verse 25 for he must reign until he has put his uh, all his enemies under his feet. Now remember, there's kind of a continuation going on here. Uh, who is he that must reign? Well, it's the first in rank and order of the resurrection, Christ. The context here actually comes from verse 23, which says, But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming, etc. Okay, because this thought unit is really directly related to the one before it. For a moment, I actually entertained making this a part of the preceding paragraph, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't. I, uh, <laughs> um, I still think there's enough different information and emphasis here to make it a distinct thought unit. And that word reign is the Greek word basileo, uh, literally to rule as sovereign. Now that word for reign in verse 25 is actually the Greek word basileo. Uh, it, li it means literally to rule as sovereign. Um, the note in vines for this specific reference is that it is used in the sense here of Christ ruling even though he was rejected by the Jews. Uh, he's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords, and yet he was rejected by Anna Ananias and Caiaphas as the enemy of the Jewish people. Um, he was delivered over to the Roman authorities for crucifixion. They killed him, and he didn't stay dead. Um, he was raised from the grave, and now he sits on the throne of the universe with God his Father. Um, his reign will last until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the image that it evokes uh, by the by this phrase is the sovereign standing over the defeated enemy with his foot on top of them as they lay prone on the ground at least that's what I see now verse 26 says the last enemy that will be abolished 
is death. So with that imagery in mind, of a victor standing over his prone and defeated enemy, Paul records this complete sentence. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Wow! I mean, think about what this means in terms of what it's saying according to logic. Okay, first, death is an enemy. <laughs> okay, uh, now we kind of know that instinctively we all try and avoid it. Uh, it's called self-preservation. Nobody really particularly wants to die. Uh, at least not naturally speaking, okay? It, it's something that's not meant or intended for man, basically. Um, and in the previous thought unit, we considered that one man in his disobedience to God brought it upon man, and it, be, and it came in doing... It, it came in basically just doing what it does, killing us. Um, all of us. <laughs> uh, yeah, it kills all of us. When I was in the insurance world, um, we had a statistic that people somehow, when you pointed this out to them, they were flabbergasted and amazed. Uh, because it's a very clear and obvious truth. Um, the actuaries, that is the guys who price the insurance policies, say it this way. The mortality rate is ultimately 100%. Um, the statisticians say it like this. Um, the, the ratio of people who will die is one out of one. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, uh, the, I usually put it like this. Well, that's life. Nobody gets out alive. Um, death is an enemy, and it's seen as such. And it has been ever since man's been on the scene. But it also says, secondly that death will be abolished. Of all the powerful enemies of humanity, death is the most powerful, and it will claim all of us, barring a direct intervention of God. Yet for all of that power, it's temporary. Um, it will be abolished, and has in fact already been defeated in the believer, who has no reason to fear it anymore. Uh, we don't have to be afraid to die, beloved. Now, maybe the how, mostly because I'm a wimp and I don't like pain, uh, but not the event itself. Uh, I don't want to shame my Lord when I die, so, you know, if I, if I die in pain, there's a... Anyway, moving on. Verse 27, For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. The first thing to note in this verse is that Paul is quoting Psalm 8 verse 6. Uh, and that reads, You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Now Psalm 8 is a messianic psalm, meaning the he referred to here is the Messiah, who in Greek is called Christ. Okay, that would be Jesus. Uh, have you got the impression that this is stated, though, like it's already happened? Um, well, you should. This is God's way of telling us that this is a done deal. It's going to happen. Um, the verse, though, is making an exception. For the one that has all things put in subjection under his feet doesn't have everything under his feet. The one that does the putting under the feet is, ex is accepted. Not accepted like approved, but accepted as in made an exception. Um, what's that mean? Well, God the Father placed all things in subjection to the Son. More, it means that when Jesus has completed his own part of conquering everything, it will have excluded God the Father. Next verse. Verse 28. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. Uh, in fact, at the very end, when it's all finished, 
Jesus will basically do as he has always done, and that it is that is to submit it to God the Father. Now, I find it really fascinating that people will say things like, oh, well, no, it's not fair, and what if he doesn't want to do that? Jesus always did this. This is the way it has always been for him. Um, it's not a new idea. Uh, even when Jesus was here on earth, he was doing this. Uh, see what it says in John 5, verses 19 to 23. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so also uh, the Son gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, I know this isn't what this passage is particularly saying uh, in, its, in its own context, but factually it is showing that Jesus was doing what God the Father was doing. Let me rephrase that appropriately. Jesus, in doing what the Father showed him, was submitting to God the Father. Didn't have to. Must have wanted to. I, I don't know what form this grand and what seems to be a final submission will take. Will it be an event? Will there be a ceremony? Uh, you can ask my brother Dan, who's on the call this evening, um, you know, uh, if, if when we were in university I said stuff like this. Sounds like a party to me. <laughs> okay. Um, will it be a solemnized surrender? Well, perhaps. But I can't help but think that all of the people that will be present will not only know what's going on, but will wholeheartedly agree with such a surrender and submission. It actually sounds like a great reason for a royal celebration for all the sons and daughters of the king who will be present there. <laughs> um, what I'm seeing here is that this thought unit talks about the one who did the resurrecting, God the Father. He's the one who Isaiah saw when he was called as a prophet, and he served as a prophet under four kings. That's uh, Uzziah, also known as Azariah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, before King Manasseh ordered him sawn in half from top to bottom. Uh, he's the one that called Jeremiah, who saw the destruction of Jerusalem, who the people of Israel had to stone to get him to stop prophesying bad things about them. Now, there was a better way, but they chose not to repent. Okay, It's the same Ancient of Days that called Ezekiel, who was murdered with a knife after confronting a man about his adultery. It's the same Holy One that called Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Joel, and all the other prophets. It is this God that sent His Son to knowingly and voluntarily die as a vicarious substitute for our sins. This is God the Father Himself, the great architect, and no, I'm not a mason, okay, that designed the universe for His Son to create. He has all the power to do this and more, and it is He that raised Jesus from the grave. It is He that will change our mortal bodies, whether living or dead, into immortal and forever living beings in a future resurrection of glory. Praise His name for all of His power and majesty. Praise the King. Hallelujah. Which brings us to our final thought unit for this evening, verses 29 to 34, Incentives for Resurrection. 
Now, any longtime followers of this Bible study will certainly not be surprised if there is a gospel incentive here, because that's what Paul was all about, really. Uh, and he wrote about it in, in every letter in some fashion, even if it was obliquely, like in Philemon. Uh, it should come as no surprise that Paul, who is the prime purveyor of the gospel to the Gentiles, would dangle incentives to a believer, uh, to being a believer rather, and entering into this resurrection. In fact, we would be appropriately shocked if he did not. Um, this is a simple enough text, but its language is surprising because it is less than precise in some places, which is surprising for Paul. Um, that makes understanding it more complex than some of the other places in Scripture that Paul wrote. Uh, with that said, let's dig in. Verse 29. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for him? Or, uh, sorry, are they baptized for them? Now the first thing to notice is that this verse starts with the word otherwise, which is a conjunction of course, but it is, it is a conjunction that indicates a comparison between ideas. And, and so it's sensitive to the context of what came before. The verses immediately uh, before provide this context, and they talk about how the Lord Jesus Christ uh, will in the end, when it has all been conquered, willingly submit to God the Father. Well, that's no help in understanding it, is it? Um, so that that's not really a question, by the way. Um, that means we have to go right back to the original thread, as it were. Um, and that was in the last study in our discussion of how the resurrection actually had to have happened and is central to Christianity. Um, that actually makes a comparison-like conjunction here make some sense. Um, that would make a line of reasoning sound kind of like this. The resurrection had to have happened because if it didn't, the word otherwise, uh, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? That's what it would say. Wait, what? You heard that, right? Baptized for the dead? What in the world does that mean? <laughs> well, uh, whenever I don't understand something, I, I look to see what everybody else says about it. Um, I usually have very good sources. Those very good sources are actually all over the map. <laughs> Um, however, I, I have an idea based on context uh, what this, what this, what I think it means. Okay, and I'll tell you what that is and why I think that. Uh, but first, I have to tell you what it is most definitely not. Um, a particularly well-known cult uh, that says it is Christian but really is not. Uh, believes that this means that we can be vicariously baptized in the place of the dead. Now, that actually is within the translation matrix for the Greek uh, preposition hyper, um, and that's the word we're talking about here. Um, but the meaning directly contradicts what the scriptures say about baptism, and what it says about justification by faith. So that particular version of what this uh, of what this means is well, unironically moronic, <laughs> uh, just like that cult's priesthood. Now you know who I'm talking about. <clears throat> so uh, the preposition hyper or hooper uh, is very imprecise. Imprecise, it seems. Uh, it can be translated as for over, exceedingly, more than, in place of, and we just looked at that, uh, or even because of, which is what I prefer here as the one that makes sense but doesn't violate the ideas of justification by faith, or the idea that each believer needs to be baptized in obedience to Christ. Um, what this evokes 
is the idea that people are baptized because of the dead. Perhaps like Stephen, whose illegal execution Paul actually witnessed. Um, yeah, in his dying, Stephen gave testimony to God and the goodness of him and how he was standing probably to re receive his beloved Stephen at the time of his death. That was Acts chapter 8. So what's the first thing that happens in Acts chapter 9? Saul of Tarsus is radically saved by the risen Christ himself and becomes Paul the Apostle. Okay, well he becomes the person who would, be, who, who would become the Apostle. Um, why do I think this is the likely meaning to Paul or of Paul here? Well, back in the days of Paul, baptism had become synonymous with being a believer and follower of Christ. If you think about this, only real believers under persecution, and they were, would be baptized. Because when you make that kind of witnessable, public declaration of your faith, it's pretty tough to back out of it, isn't it? Um, again, that's a statement, not a question. Baptism in those d days equaled Christianity. Um, since that time, however, we've had all kinds of time to confuse the issue with, thing, with things like being vicariously baptized for your dead relatives that you would want to see again in heaven, whether they should be there or not. Um, yeah. However, this idea of baptizing, baptism rather, uh, being synonymous with Christianity does not break anything. How many people do you know that came to Christ as a result of someone who has died? Um, in a sense, we all have, because Christ died for us. Um, and he was raised from the dead. As such, so are we, but in real terms. Baptism is a visual representation of that. It's a symbol. Think about what the ordinance of baptism really is. Using the real-world symbol of a body of water, which symbolizes both the Word of God, Jesus, see John 1.1, 1, 1, um, who does the work uh, of both the propitiation and expiation for our sins. So he atones for it, and then he cleanses us from it, basically. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and then it talks about, it, 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 it simultaneously speaks of the Spirit of God, who does the washing and the actual work of changing your nature. Um, so you die to the world and join Christ in death as you go down into the water. Okay? Um, and then you stay there, right? No! That's a joke I tell baptismal candidates. We hold you down till the bubble stops, so we know the devil's really gone. You no, know, we don't do that. No, you're lifted out of the water, and you join Christ in resurrection. All of this is highly symbolic, conveying no saving grace at all, but it is the first act of Christian obedience. Jesus himself was baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River. Uh, recently, a, uh, well not so recently, it's a couple of years ago now, but a uh, recording artist of some renown in Christian circles, who I'm not sure is actually a Christian, uh, was himself baptized in the Jordan River because the Jordan River made it a special baptism. Does it really though? Does that, does, it, does that make a baptism performed in the Jordan River of more spiritual significance than, say, one performed in Bethany's baptismal tank? No! Okay, it's a symbol. If an unregenerated person or an unbeliever or someone who is lost, synonyms for the same thing, is baptized anywhere, he or she is still an unbeliever. Okay, all they got was wet. Um, now think about what this verse is saying according to what I believe to be correct. The second part of this verse says, If the dead are not raised at all, then why are they baptized? Because of their testimony to the world. If there's no resurrection, 
there was no purpose for their witness and no purpose for the ordinance of baptism and that's what Paul says and he says it right here that makes baptism or becoming a Christian if you will one who escapes the wrath of God and participates in this resurrection a desired uh, make that incentivized concept and, and this fits into the rest of the narrative of the chapter without stretching anything out of any kind of context see the next verse verse 30 why are we also in danger every hour now if we were to take that sentence just by itself just leave it floating out there in the air people would go I don't know I guess it doesn't make sense to be in danger every hour I mean you should go run and hide right you know you know but Paul isn't demanding to know the reasons that he faces danger every hour okay he he's he's asking if there is no resurrection why are we doing all of this <laughs> you know this is Paul's rhetorical way of asking things and we've seen this all over his letters including earlier in this one okay he's saying something like this look if there are no, if there is no resurrection why would I bother it's because there is a rex resurrection and it's gonna be a good thing <laughs> okay and he really was in danger because of those things you know this was written from the road while on a missionary journey the Roman persecution of Nero was the only thing that hadn't come to fruition yet um, this was after his visit to Thessalonica where they drove him away you know and after Lystra where they stoned him and left him for dead that's where Timothy was and that's maybe even where he got saved um, Berea was mentioned by way of contrast by the way and I mentioned them because we are the Berean nation okay um, but why were they mentioned by way of contrast because rather than just getting mad because he wasn't keeping the traditions of the Pharisees they searched the scriptures at the time the Old Testament that's all they had to see if what Paul was saying was so and they found him in large part to be correct so Paul was decidedly in danger just from that and there was more but that's in 2 Corinthians where this humble man is forced to defend himself by giving his real credentials. And we'll get there probably in a few weeks. Um, verse 31. I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Now Paul is using the Greek knee here for I attest this is a word that is used uh, for an, attest, an attestation to an oath kind of like when Jesus would say truly truly um, this is like Paul saying truly truly okay but to what is he attesting well the upshot here is he swears he dies daily what Paul is saying here because of the Greek is that he dies with Christ every day and that's my current understanding of this um, and it's the rest of the verse that makes me think this why because Paul's actually boasting that the Corinthians are proof of his apostleship here uh, and that work of Christ was actually assigned to Paul you know so he died to his own self he died to his own desires certainly he died to his sins every day and this is speaking by way of bragging about it in his new nature in Christ and he's incentivizing that new nature as another perk of those who will experience this resurrection it's a gospel perk folks verse 32 if from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus what does it profit me if the dead are not raised let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die now we're not certain really if Paul actually fought literal wild beasts at Ephesus uh, though there is some tradition that supports that 
Uh, the speculation is that he fought bulls in the public games to Artemis, or Diana, the Roman name, uh, as a prisoner. Um, basically, uh, the Romans called this damnatio ad bestias, uh, which means uh, condemnation of beasts. Survive the beasts, you go free. Um, and that certainly was a part of the games. In fact, some think that the adjective wild was added, uh, not by Paul, to differentiate this from what the majority of commentators, and I myself, uh, think. And I, I don't actually favor this, that Paul fought bulls or other wild beasts. Um, because Paul is a Roman, he could not have legally been forced to fight wild animals. It was a right he had as a Roman citizen to decline that. Um, he, he had, there were other things that they had to do to uh, try and execute him and eventually he ended up uh, having his head cut off because uh, they couldn't crucify him as a Roman citizen. You couldn't crucify Romans for the kind of, for even major crimes. So, um, and, and what we've seen is that um, Paul used his status as a Roman to his advantage when it suited his and God's purposes. So, I favor the idea that Paul is describing, well, at least describing in part, uh, his confrontation with the mob that was incited by, I think, Alexander the coppersmith, where they all chanted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours straight. Now, Paul could have been using the metaphor of wild animals because of the danger that he and his companions would have been in. Now, building on that idea... Paul may have been speaking about or including some of the Greek philosophers here um, that he would have encountered and characterized them as wild animals that seek to tear a, a man apart but at the level of understanding through vain philosophy. And this is given some credence by Paul himself in the rest of the verse because Paul is quoting one of these Greek philosophers named Epicurus. Um, the ultimate battle, though, and, and Paul explains this in a few different places, uh, is not with flesh and blood. His clearest description of this is in Ephesians chapter 6, and he talks about the principalities and the powers of the air, the, the de demonic and dark forces behind all the animosity of the incited crowd, or even the philosophy that he would have encountered. Any or all of these, in some combination, would also satisfy the use of wild beasts by Paul regarding his experiences in Ephesus. What Paul is saying is something like this, if the dead are not resurrected, then why would I want to do any of this? And I think the vain philosophers have more to do with the whole picture than some others from my analysis of this text. Next verse, verse 33, do not be deceived bad company corrupts good morals. You see, this, this verse only makes sense if he is speaking about people in the previous verse, particularly the followers of Epicurus, who were at heart hedonists. For the record, hedonism is from the Greek hedony, meaning pleasure. I mean, without the gospel, that really is the only alternative worldview, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, Solomon went this way in Ecclesiastes, and you can read about the meaningless of uh, meaninglessness, the meaninglessness of it, uh, and how it basically drove him nuts. Um, you'll need to, if you need to find it because you want to do that. It's immediately after the Proverbs in the Old Testament, which follow the Psalms. Uh, but why say this here? It comes from the context of what Paul has just said which was something like, don't listen to the Epicureans. <laughs> I know he didn't say that word for word. Um, also, this living for pleasure as the highest ideal is a deception, according to this verse. Um, another word for deception is lie. Don't believe it, and don't hang around with those who believe it or practice it. That's the working out of their believing in it. Um, if you do, and you are a believer, 
they will eventually corrupt your good morals and beloved this is also completely consistent with Paul's own theology Christians have a new nature and should have the ability to say no to their ungodly desires and if something is causing you to fall into sin put that thing or person or practice well not the person but put that thing or practice uh, or proximity to something or someone to death deny the enemy the opportunity to exploit your weakness and grow in strength simultaneously by doing so those things in in this case happen at the same time um, now if, so for example if you have a problem with pornea let's call it then stop using it if you have a problem with gluttony um, you know, uh, now I'll define gluttony. It's a covetous desire for food combined with a lack of self control in eating of it. So if you have a problem with gluttony, go on a diet and, g and get some help and educate yourself about the kind of foods you can and should have. Learn some self control. Here's, a, here's an interesting one. If you have an issue looking at 18 year old guys and having homosexual fantasies, stop looking at their naked pictures on the web! It's pretty simple. Notice I didn't use the word easy. I understand that. Look, if you, continue, if you continually expose yourself to an opportunity to sin, then because we're all weak and because we're all sinners, we will sin. And John Owen would frown because that's the exact opposite of the mortification of sin that Paul commands in Romans. Bad company or association will corrupt good morals. Don't let the flashing lights fool you. They're distracting to begin with. Don't be lied to. Verse 34 Become sober-minded as you ought, and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Paul follows up that statement in a way that kind of seals the deal for my own understanding of the context of this whole wild beast thing in Ephesus, being a combination of philosophers that Paul encountered there. Uh, along with the mob who were also demonically energized. I mean, come on, they chanted the same phrase angrily for two hours. You know, um, and, and, and in Ephesus, just from the words that Paul uses and what we know of what Paul was like from history and an analysis of the text, this phrase, as opposed to... Uh, as opposed to the bad company that corrupts good morals, become sober-minded as you ought. All that stuff I was on a tear about a minute ago, in the previous verse, I wasn't making that up. Paul's saying, wake up. Be of sober mind. This is what you should be doing as you ought. Um, so stop sinning. You have a problem with this sin or that sin? Then cut it out, says Paul. However, it is the reasoning for this cessation of sinful activity that should grab our attention. It is both sobering and shameful all at the same time. For some have no knowledge of God. This has a double meaning, perhaps. Uh, the first and obvious meaning is that Christians do not know God and cannot tell people about him or how to follow him or how to overcome sin, etc. Beloved, look, they call it the new birth. Babies are naturally without a whole lot of knowledge and they literally have to learn almost everything. And this isn't any different. And in some ways it's harder because 
We have to unlearn our sinful habits. And, and that's where the business of mortifying sin comes in. But if you are in a place, and, and Corinth is described as such a place, that you're not growing, that is a shame to every member of your congregation for not being serious about their own growth. And we've all been in churches like that, I think. Now the second, although more sp more speculative than the first uh, thing, is that is just as possible in Corinth, is that there are actual unsaved people in your gathering. And they have never heard the gospel. As one brother who's here tonight uh, likes to say, uh, <laughs> in other words, just like the United Church of Canada. <laughs> you know, wh what do you expect that has an actual atheist, when they have an actual atheist as their moderator, and, and they still employ a church pastor who doesn't believe in God? Okay? You still think this can't happen? Then, then why does our provincial government need to license people to perform marriages? Just wait, my friends. This is gonna this is gonna turn nasty, and they're coming for everyone else. I'll tell you why that that lady pastor has a job. It's because she sued the United Church, and they settled out of court. And part of the agreement was that she could keep her job because the congregation still wanted her around. Okay, look, I don't care what flavor of Christian you are. The lions think all of us taste good. <laughs> Okay, Methodists, Pentecostals, Independents, Presbyterians, and Baptists, and anyone else. Okay, they're coming for all of us. Just as an aside, you don't actually have to register your church with the government. Now, of course, you can't benefit from things like the tax exempt status that they offer a, a registered charity, which your church will become. But that shouldn't matter. That's Caesar trying to bait us into registration. And if you don't see that, look, I'm really sorry for you. When the cops show up to close us down, look, I'm just going to grab my coat and leave. I'm not going to argue with the police. Yes, officer. The lo and, and there's a reason for that. The location that you're in, or, or the building, isn't the church, even though that's what we call it. The church is the called out of the world group of people that you're with. And if they throw me in jail for running an underground unregistered church, well then I guess God's ordained that I've got a prison ministry. But in this space of grace, we're still allowed to operate as a registered charity, so I'll stick around. But to let those unregenerate, unwashed, lost people to continue to sit in your congregation without preaching the gospel to them every chance you get. That's shameful and fatal. I speak this to your shame, says Paul. Look with me for a moment at Revelation chapter 3. Uh, I don't usually do this, uh, but I need to explain something about this whole topic as it presents itself today. And you need to understand what the church has become. Look here in Revelation chapter 3 from verses 14 to 22. I'll read this to you. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself and that shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and the eye and eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see 
Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you ever noticed that well, has anyone here ever heard the idea that one can take the seven churches that these letters are written to and fit them into a kind of prophetic history of the church, starting with Ephesus, going through Laodicea, okay? Um, but that starts with Ephesus where they lost their first love, Jesus. Well, they didn't lose it, they left it. That's a different story, but... Um, well, you can um, and it's not a new idea either. Uh, Andrew Miller's church history is arranged in this fashion, and the book was written in the early 1800s. Um, it's useful at least to consider the model. Ephesus was the church in the beginning of the movement of Christianity. Smyrna is that same church under persecution. Pergamum is where the church marries the world. I have just described the first four to five hundred years of church history. Okay, um, and Thyatira is what arises out of Pergamum, and it's the opulence of the Catholic cult that came out of that. Um, <laughs> this this uh, <laughs> this actually makes Sardis the church of the Reformation. Uh, and that's kind of a scary thing. You know, I, I know you. You have a reputation for being alive, but really you're dead. Yeah, no, not, not a fun thing. Yeah. Okay, it's a bit scary. But then comes Philadelphia, which is the church of brotherly love, with a dead formalism of the Reformation, uh, which you can see perhaps best in the modern Lutheran movement, uh, is left... And love is understood to be the main operating principle of the church, like we saw in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, which, which also needs right doctrine and right practice, as is found in the scriptures. And after that period of time comes Laodicea. You know, um, do you know the Greek roots of the words that make up the, the name for the city of Laodicea? Well, uh, the first one is Laos, the people, which we should be familiar with from the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Nikos power, Laos over the people. See, names have significance. So Laos, the people, and diocesia, meaning the realm or domain. We significantly get our English word diocese from it. In verse 20 of our text in Revelation, where do we find Jesus in relation to this church? Anybody? How about outside? Okay, why? Because it's no longer his church. It is the people's church. They dictate what happens, not an adherence to his word. Beloved, that is at least where we're coming to in oh. church history. I don't know. Maybe we should have a conference on this. What do you think, brothers? Um, you know, uh, seven letters to seven churches. What do you think? Maybe we can do that when the lockdown lifts. I, I don't know. What do you think? Anyway, my point here is that this is a great shame today. Okay? Beloved, we have people like this sitting in our midst. We do a fair job of preaching the gospel to them when we can as well, but we need to do better. Otherwise, we need to start lining up for the ISAV, just like the rest of Laodicea. Um, now, that's our text this evening. But I need to say that next week we're going to see a whole new set of things connected to the resurrection. And some of next week will bring up another set of controversies that the church still faces because what I've learned from history is that not everyone learns from history. <laughs> when someone commits heresy and goes off into error, 
that error is always refuted by spiritual authority by means of the scriptures, isn't it? However, that error doesn't go away. And it serves the enemy's purpose of putting up a counterfeit to the truth to draw people away from Christ. This is tragic, but it also serves God's purposes in that his actual people, those who will follow his son regardless of cost, whatever that cost may be, are revealed and are even warned and taught to practice that gift of the Holy Spirit that we need today more than ever, the gift of discernment. It is the Holy Spirit that gives this gift, as seen in the first part of chapter 12, and it is operated effect effectually only by the love that we saw in chapter 13. And it is used effectively if it is used in order, as we saw in chapter 14. Well, why are these things used? Well, according to chapter 15, we use these things to show that Jesus died to pay the price for our wrongdoings and was raised from the dead by God the Father to show that it's true so that we may now repent and follow the Lord Jesus as our Lord and King. This has some interesting meanings and we're going to look at them briefly next time. And that's what I saw in the chapter this evening. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for showing us these things in the chapter this evening. We ask, Lord, that you would help especially uh, the idea of Laodicea to sink into our hearts as those who are perhaps sitting in a modern day Laodicea. Lord, help us to take those actions so that we will be those overcomers, not so that we may sit down with you on your throne, but because we are following you in obedience in the power of that resurrection that God the Father will visit upon all of us when you return. Lord, we thank you for these things. We ask you to keep us safe for the rest of the evening and bring us to our book study tomorrow evening. And Lord, we want to pray for the technical layout now that we would have a lot less problems than we did this evening. For we pray in his precious name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless you. And remember, it is the duty for all Bereans to study the scriptures daily to find out what it says and what is so. May the Lord bless you until the next time we meet. In his precious name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi, Jerry from Berean Nation. I'm so glad you, you came and watched the study with us. Uh, if you're catching this sort of after the fact, you're seeing right now that little bit I always tack on at the end. Uh, it's to let you know that if you would like a copy of this message, it is available. Uh, all you need to do is send an email to the address at the top of the site and let me know that you'd like it and which one you'd like. And I can get you a copy of it on DVD for $10 per DVD plus shipping and handling for the lot. If you want to do lot stuff, you might have to give me time to come up with it all. Um, having said that, this is all on YouTube for free for as long as YouTube will let it be there. And if while that's still going on, you want a copy of it, you can actually go and look at it on YouTube yourself and I have no problem with that. That's why we put it up there. It is meant to be free. The only reason there's a charge for the DVD is because I have to pay to buy the stuff to produce it. Um, now, if you have any questions for me, or if you just want to say hi, um, you can email me at pastorjer at Outlook.com. Now, uh, that's a kind of a specialized email address. Pastor is the Latin spelling for pastor. So it's pastor, but it has an E on the end. And my name is actually Gerald, or I called Jerry, but um, it could be shortened to Jer, but that starts with the letter G. So G-E-R, pastor, pastor Jer, and then at Outlook.com. So Pastor, the Latin way of spelling pastor, Jer, the German way of spelling Jer, and at Outlook.com, the Microsoft way of spelling, this is my email address. So uh, it's on the top of the web page you're watching this on. Please feel free to use it. Um, if you have any questions at all, go ahead and ask. Shoot me an email. Um, 
it's my personal email, so please don't abuse the privilege. Um, alternatively, I should let you know that we are on Patreon. If you like what you've seen here, and you would like to be involved with supporting this ministry monetarily, because we do actually have expenses here. Somebody got to pay for the web server, somebody got to pay for the site, somebody got to pay for uh, the stuff to get up there and all of that stuff. The video has to get edited, all of that, you know, stuff needs to be done. And if you, if the Lord has put it on your heart to participate voluntarily, then you can go to Patreon and you can join for one of four different levels. We have a $1 level, a $5 level, a $10 level, and a $20 level that you can join for and any way you want to do that I'm completely happy if you never do I don't use exclusive content to bait people into doing things like I said I'm not in this to make money buy the truth and sell it not is my principle um, alternatively you could go and buy my book on amazon.com it's called practical discipleship the hard copy if that's what you need is uh, $4 and if you need volume uh, you should contact me directly because I can probably get a better deal plus shipping and handling kind of thing. Now uh, having said that um, there's a Kindle version and it's 99 cents so if you're like me and you like Kindle stuff buy the 99 cent version this doesn't have to cost you more than you want it to. Okay I'm not, you put, your, put your wallet back in your pocket your money's safe. Um, so all that the price there is is reflective of the time and effort I put into writing this short little treatise on the best way to practice your Christianity because it's the way that the very first group of people who were ever called a church did. Now, uh, if you're in Ottawa, Canada, or if you're going to be in Ottawa, Canada, and you want to get together with me, shoot me an email at the address on the top of the screen or dial the phone number that you can see there that will ring on my cell phone or it will be delivered to my cell phone and we can keep talk, we can make arrangements to get together, have a coffee, whatever it is you need. I look forward to hearing from you and seeing uh, you in the future. Now again I will thank you for watching the video that you just watched and I know that we've closed in prayer already but Listen, we're glad you're here. We're glad you came. And if you have needs, we're glad to help. So, this is Jerry from Berean Nation signing off, reminding you to read the scriptures daily to make sure these things are so. Lord bless you.